So uh, the mystics will tell you um, that duality is an illusion. And uh, if you've heard accounts of people who have taken uh, psychedelic drugs and stuff like this, uh, you'll hear, you'll have heard the claim, I became at one with the universe. Uh, in other words, it becomes a seamless whole where there's no separation of parts. Um, and the Chinese yin yang symbol is, is a way of trying to express this because the symbol itself is a whole and you have the two wavy, you have the wavy line in the middle, you have the black background and the white background. But in the black background, there's a little white dot. In the white background, there's a black dot. What that's trying to express is that the seed of everything contains the seed of its opposite. Okay. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, and very off the cuff, I haven't really taken notes. I did write down a little thing on my uh, whiteboard, but that's about it. Um, there are so many examples of the yin-yang of music. Um, which can be expressed in so many ways, too. I mean, in terms of the music theory, it's in the music theory. You can find it in rhythm. You can find it in uh, melody. You can find it in, um, uh, well, so many things. What I'm going to point out is a lot of uh, the stuff that comes from, uh, that comes out of the music theory. Now, the Greeks had a term um, called, uh, the term was tetrachord, and a tetrachord is basically when you uh, take the two halves of a major scale. Um, now, when you look at a major scale, all right, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, you would say it's not symmetrical because here we have whole half and here we have whole, whole, whole half. So you can't split it in the middle and say they are symmetrical. However, this little point here, if we, if we uh, avoid that one little whole step between F and G, I'm going to turn this around now. When we split the scale C, D, E, F, and then G, A, B, C, we find the exact whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half. Okay. You can see it clearly on a keyboard. Uh, the tetrachords consist of in the key of C, C, D, E, F, and there's whole, whole, half right there. And then we move over to G, G, A, B, C, and it's whole, whole, half again. Notice that this looks just like this. Um, Okay, once again, this, and then this. All right, so there is a kind of symmetry there. Um, I want to give examples of uh, the yin-yang of music uh, in, in uh, many different forms and contexts. For example, the most basic yin-yang of music is silence and sound. Okay, you have silence, you place sound on it. And uh, one thing I've always said about the great bass players is they understand the space between the notes. The great bass players know how to, how to use the space between the notes rather than uh, thinking about the notes themselves. That's what I've heard. The bass player in my band, the Blue Kind, is awesome that way. He really, you know, a lot of musicians have a temptation to just fill space, uh, silence up with notes and notes and notes and notes as if they're afraid of the silence. And I'm guilty of that, I have to admit. I play a lot of notes when I play. But as far as the principle, I do understand it and I do get it. Uh, so sa sound versus silence is one example of the yin-yang of music, probably the most primal example of that yin-yang. Now, although I've said there are three chord qualities, major, minor, and dominant seventh, Prior to that, there's only major and minor. And the reason I say that is when you build a dominant seventh chord, it's an offshoot of a major chord. So, and that adds a note to it. If we were to remove that added note, we only have two chords, ma major, happy, minor, sad, okay? Uh, so there's your yin yang again, the happy versus sad uh, continuum. Um, God, there's so much stuff. Um, Another kind of yin-yang that doesn't appear as opposites, and maybe this kind of explains the whole duality as an illusion thing a little better, is parallel versus relative, which I want to do a whole talk on that uh, key concept in music. Very, very important concept. It's all over music. And uh, the simplest answer to uh, what is parallel versus relative is relative is within the key and Parallel is outside of the key. So if I go uh, C, D, E, F, 
all right? Um, that's relative to the key of C, if I happen to be in the key of C. That's relative to the key of C. Um, if I go, so that's do, re, mi, fa, all right? If I go sol, and la, and ti from the same key, it's all related because all the notes are the same key. Now, if I, if I went, uh, instead of uh, do, re, mi, fa in the key of C, which is C, D, E, F, if I go into the key of E flat, I go E flat, F, G, A flat. Well, that's do, re, mi, fa again, but it's parallel to the key of C. It's in a different key altogether. That's the difference between parallel and relative. Um, now, in classical, they'll tell you otherwise, but uh, they're ignoring the first system, the Greek modes, when they tell you that. They'll say there's the relative major and the relative minor, and indeed, that's a very important yin-yang relationship in music. However, when you go outside of the major minor key system that they developed and go back to the Greek modes, you find that every note is relative to the key you're in. Uh, you think of a key as a family of notes that belong together. So relative major is the dad, relative minor is the mom, and the rest are the kids. Okay. In my book, I, I renamed um, relative major and relative minor as special relative major and special relative minor because indeed the father-mother relationship is is different than the relationship to the kids it's an important relationship but that doesn't mean they're not related to the kids okay uh, but you know the mother and father have a different relationship to the, each other than they would with their kids okay so parallel relative is another example of uh, yin yang and music um now, you could take, like, in, in terms of composition, a good composer wants to pit one against the other either simultaneously at the same moment um, or by section, all right? For example, I mentioned in another um, uh, video that um, Igor Stravinsky, at this time when everything kind of topped out and anything went, he decided that if you do 32 bars of dissonance, you have to resolve it with 32 bars of consonance or harmony. So that was his way of dealing with the yin yang of, of that period, which was a difficult time really um, in terms of creativity because there were almost too many choices. And who's to say which was the best choice and which wasn't? Um, yeah, so that. Now, uh, now, when we talk about, say for example, Let's talk about rhythm for a second. Slow tempo versus fast tempo. Okay, that's one yin yang in rhythm. Now, you would tend to think that the faster tempo or the more upbeat tempo would be the more danceable one or the more kind of active one, and the slower tempo would be the more passive, relaxed one. Well, when you take that yin yang, uh, all right, so let's think of it like this. Uh, a minor key is sad, all right? So if I went, oh, uh, sorry. Right? That's all in a minor key, and it has a very sad feeling to it. Now, nothing wrong with that. But uh, say you want to do, uh, pit the one thing against another. In other words, like, well, what if I gave it a, a snappy up-tempo feeling, that same set of chords, but with a minor key uh, sadness. So we get. Which, by the way, is off my first record, Loop Du Jour. Um, all right, so in any case, uh, that's an example of how a composer would pit. You could say, in a sense, that a slow rhythm would be equivalent to minor and a fast rhythm would be equivalent to major, sad, happy, sad, happy. So we're pitting that happy rhythm against the sad chord, the C minor chord as root. So there's an example of um, how a good composer uses yin yang. Composers will always have a good sense of that yin yang. Very, very common in music is um, pitting relative major against relative minor. All right. In other words, perhaps you'll do a verse that's in uh, the relative major and a chorus that's in the relative minor or vice versa. And why do you want to do this? Because you want to interest a person's ear, okay? Uh, when you pit one thing against another, another like that, it makes for a more interesting sound, uh, less predictable, you know, if that's the case. Uh, now, an example of pitting relative major and relative minor uh, within the same piece of music, but kind of not 
not separated by verse and chorus in this case, but kind of integrated within the progression itself would be the song uh, Autumn Leaves, which progression goes. And here we have the major key. Then the minor key. And it repeats major. And here's our resolution to the major key. And then minor and resolution to the minor key. Now when they continue, it goes back to minor. Then it goes to major. Back to minor. Back to minor. Now, another uh, thing you may have noticed is that quick. All right. Now, if you notice, for most of the progression, there are four, be four beats per chord. One, two, uh, sorry, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And in fact, it continues like that. But when we go to the bridge, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And again, it continues, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, three, four. But now we get one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. And then we're back to our one, two, three, four after that. So again, that little bit of danciness that happens when we, we, we move from uh, a four beat chord movement to a two beat chord movement. Again, that's kind of a yin yang thing because you're changing up the, the, the rhythmic principle there. Okay, you're changing up the momentum. Uh, you know, we're constantly hearing um, four beats to uh, a chord, four beats to a chord, four beats to a chord. Well, the ear perks up when it hears something different like that sudden two beats to a chord. Suddenly it's more interesting. So all composers really, really do understand this principle of the yin yang and music and how it works. Um, I'm going to pause this for a second because um, I want to think of some other stuff since I didn't take notes, but there's certainly a ton of stuff here. So let me take a little pause. Okay, so I have a few more ideas here. Um, uh, another thing to look at in the yin yang of music would be the range of an instrument and what can be done with it. Uh, Igor Stravinsky, uh, the very opening of the piece, uh, The Rite of Spring, uh, starts out with a bassoon in a very, very high register that's normally uh, not considered viable on the bassoon. And it gave sort of a, back in those days, it, it sounded kind of quacky, a quacky type of sound. But uh, lately, the technology has gotten so good with instrument making and the players themselves got so good that they're able to play that introduction line smoothly without the quacky sound. However, that's not what Stravinsky intended. He did intend to have that quacky sound. That was whole, his whole reason of putting it in there. So there's a case of like, a, um, you take a, a, the range of an instrument and bring it to, it's not exactly the opposite, but you're bringing it to something that's normally outside or beyond its range. Now, another thing is um, in rhythm, a few things, uh, like in New Orleans, a very interesting thing they did in New Orleans music was if you're doing this on a guitar, straight eighth notes, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, the drummer would play it, instead of the drummer going bump, bump, bop, bump, 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 he'd go bump, 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 I don't know if I could do this. Um, so, in other words, the German would play swing eighth notes while the other musicians were playing straight eighth notes. A very bizarre tradition and a very strange feeling. But when these guys have it locked in, it's got a groove of its own that's kind of interesting. Now, uh, maybe we could look at this idea of uh, every opposite, uh, everything contains the seed of its opposite. So, if we look at that in harmony, all right, if I take... Uh, in one instance, if I take an A minor chord, the notes are A, C, and E. If I take a C major chord, I have C, E, and G. What those two chords have in common are C and E uh, in their uh, construction. So A minor, 
with its C and E contains the seed of its opposite C major, and C major with its C and E contains the seed of its opposite mm -hmm. A minor. All right. Now we could do that also um, with with one chord construction without changing the quality of the chord uh, from major to minor in one sense at least. In other words, all four notes of this chord will be the same in both instances. What I'm talking about is the C major six chord which should properly be called C major at 13, but whatever, academia is not gonna to listen to me. Um, C major six contains the chords C, E, G, A. Now memorize those notes for a second, C, E, G, A. Uh, An A minor seven chord contains the notes of A, C, E, G. But wait, th those are the same four, chord, four notes. Um, let me... Uh, outline it for you. C major 6, A minor 7. All right, so ignore this stuff over on this side. C, E, G, A, A, C, E, G. Well, if you look closely, those are the same four notes. So how can those chords possibly be different? All right, so here's A minor 7. Uh, a, C, E, G. Now, this is a way to construct it on guitar where you can hear the difference. Now, we know that A and C are, are notes that are proper to this chord, right? If I put an A in the bass, I have the minor 7 quality. But if I take the same chord and put a C in the bass, I have a major 6 quality. Same four notes. Uh, change the bass note and it moves from minor to major uh, sound without changing a single note. You're just uh, changing, uh, you're not even changing a note when you when you um, put the A or the C in the bass. It's it's part of the chord. Uh, it, it is part of the chord, so it's uh, not changing a note. And uh, so that. Uh, now again, in composition, these are the things a composer wants to look at. If you have something in a minor key, you might want to juxtapose a, a kind of up rhythm against that minor to offset the sadness, all right? Um, if you have, let's say, for example, in a composition, you have a verse, and there's a ton of chords in your verse, so just every two beats, the chords are moving. Then when you go to a bridge or a chorus, you might want to simplify and move a chord once every two bars instead. And instead, you, you might have six chords in your verse, but two really relaxed chords in your chorus, for example. Um, now, I, I could give you tons of examples from Beatles music and stuff like that. They're always the re ready example for me, because as I've always said, any example of music theory you could find in a Beatles song somewhere. Um, but whatever the case may be regarding that, um, I, I haven't done the work, so I, I invite you to alert your ears when you're listening to music to these various yin yangs. I suggest you go to older music because uh, contemporary music doesn't have much of anything in regards to that. It's just, uh, well, you know, some of the EDM guys do it. I mean, you'll have like a lot of motion in the chords and, you know, a lot of rhythm. Happen. Then they'll do a breakdown and suddenly you'll just hear drums and bass or something like this. So there's a juxtaposition right there. Uh, all right, so in composition, I talked about giving an up rhythm to a minor key piece or in, in reverse, doing a slow rhythm in a major key. Uh, when you have a lot of chords in a verse, you have less chords in the chorus. Uh, you could have your verse be major and your chorus be relative minor or parallel minor. Um, so you have that going on, okay, uh, that kind of juxtaposition. Uh, so we have yin-yangs of tempo, we have yin-yangs of chord music movement, we have yin-yangs of chord quality, major versus, versus minor. Um, and again, uh, you know, when you equivocate these things, for example, uh, the saying is that duality is an illusion. So let's say minor to major is an illusion. Well, the blues kind of... Uh, equivocates that problem of major versus or major against minor or major being the opposite of minor, all right, when they include a minor scale against an ostensibly major chord 
um, uh, which is a blues principle, okay, minor under major. So now you're you're literally blending the yin and the yang together as one. Now the thing, one thing that you know, philosophically speaking, one thing that points to we are convinced to think of opposites. All right, that's kind of embedded into our own language. When we talk about uh, if you're a man, if you're talking about a woman, you're referring to the opposite sex. But the fact of the matter is, it's not an opposite, it's a complementary sex. They complement each other, they work together. They're not opposites. If they were, you know, if they were in uh, total enmity with each other, you wouldn't be able to produce a child, all right? Um, so you have to say they're complementary, they work together uh, as a functioning unit. All right, so the, I, you know, I, I could go on and on and on about this stuff. There's plenty of stuff you could work with. If you have a high melody in the chorus, maybe you want a lower melody in the verse, for example. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing counterpoint, okay, uh, Bach used to do this a bunch. You have a, a constant da 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 and under that you might have da 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 to complement, the ear is now being stimulated to listen to many different things, the slowness of that under melody, the quickness of that higher melody. And what that does is it lends interest to your ear, okay? Um, this is where, in a sense, repetition in music is dangerous because uh, you, if, there's no surprises. You're expecting this. This happened before. You're expecting this to happen again. What the Beatles did so well, of course, in a pop song, you're going to have repetition. You got to do a verse and a chorus and then another verse and another chorus and another verse. What the Beatles did so well was they always managed to surprise your ear. In other words, you might have heard the first verse straight and simple. Then the second verse, you might hear it in two part harmony. All right. And then the third verse, they might introduce a new instrument into it to change the color. That is good composing. Um, you always have to think. Uh, when you compose, you always have to think in terms of the listener. What are they hearing and how can I catch their ear and how can I stimulate um, their inner imagination, their audi um, audiation, as uh, Rick Beato, that term, I love it. Audiation is musical inner imagination of music, audiation. Okay. How do you stimulate that in a human being? By tickling their ears, by giving them something. They think they're expecting this, but they're going to get that. An example of that would be uh, not too much of a surprise these days, but um, let's say I have. All right, well, the ear expects. So there's a few things you could do with that. All right, you can go. Oh, sorry. Not expecting that minor chord. This has been done a bunch of times, so maybe it is a little cliche at this point, but yeah. All right, now, something interesting, now we're creating more tension, but, and it's taking us a while, but now we'll get back to that chord that we initially would have just done like that. So again, um, employing a surprise cadence tickles a person's ear, they get them interested, and it is a form of the yin-yang in this case, because when I introduced that A flat major seven, it took us way outside the key. So we're pitting one key against another yin-yang, uh, so like that. Okay. So all these, you know, always keep in mind when you listen to music, when you compose music, uh, listen for the yin yang, uh, when you're listening and compose with the yin yang in mind when you're writing. Okay. That'll make a big difference in the music, uh, especially when it comes to popular music, because again, you do something too many times as in contemporary hip hop, there's no surprises left. Uh, the soundtracks uh, for contemporary hip hop are like four to eight bars long, repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating. And oh, what time is it? All right. So try to be interesting in your writing. OK, um, I call that musical integrity. OK, an example, I was going to give a just a specific lecture on this. I called the long thought, but I'll, I'll tell you right now, like. Um, there's an old, old Beatles song. Um, now, a contemporary composer, they'd go like this. Okay, guess what?
what's coming. Da, 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 right? This is what the Beatles did. Da, 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 da. Now check that out, really, really. I mean, John Lennon had this penchant in his early days, especially for this kind of arabesque in his melodies. They just went long, and, and they were so interesting and so fitting for the chord progression. Um, that is what I call the long thought. Contemporary people in general are so ADD-ish, they can't think beyond like 10 seconds of something. So ergo... All right. Um, now you'll find that in a lot of early Beatles music. It, you know, you could look at it as kind of the work ethic. It's like, I don't want something so plain vanilla that your ear is going to expect what's coming next. I want to write something interesting. And what that does is when you, when you write a long thought, the first hearing of it, the brain can't quite lock it in and walk away and hum the melody. It needs to hear it again. And in a, in a sense, it wants to hear it again. It's like, what was that again? If somebody came up to you and really quickly told you the most amazing, most sublime thought you've ever heard before, you'd kind of go, wait, wait, uh, are you saying this? Can you, can you kind of rephrase that for me and tell me again? That's the same idea in music. Music is always speaking. Music, I'll tell you what, my philosophy, music is a language, not like one, it is one. The only difference is the meaning of the, of the words is in, in uh, the emotional life of a human being. And uh, you notice that when you talk about thoughts, right, you use many words when you talk about things you think about, you know, could be it international politics or whether there is a God or not. But when you talk about feelings, um, they're usually one word. I hate politics, and I do. Uh, I believe in a transcendent consciousness, okay? I believe there's a God, belief, I feel. Feelings are always one word, and that's the nature of music. You set an emotional tone and speak to the heart with that tone. All music should speak directly to the heart. Therefore, the message you send should be constructive and positive, okay? Um, the fact that lyrics sit upon the emotional contact that, con, uh, content that music creates, um, the lyrics are the thinking part of a human being, and the music is the emotional part of a human being. So the two languages work together very well in this particular case. But I do honestly feel that music is indeed a language. And on that note, pun intended, I'll see you guys the next time around. The video quality looks a little bit weird and snowy, which is perfect because it's uh, cold and rainy in Los Angeles. Rare weather for us, but we have a nasty front coming in. And uh, I'm lucky because I don't have any more clients to go to today so I could stay in nice and warm and cozy. Hope you all are doing well and look forward to seeing you again. Take care.